Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes? Good. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Asha Seti, and I'm a public participation specialist with the California Department of Toxic Substances Control. Um, I'd like to welcome you to this meeting on our proposal to list perfluoroalkyl and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or PFASs, in carpets and rugs as a priority product. Uh, we're seeking public comment on the product chemical profile on PFASs for carpets and rugs. Uh, in particular, we're requesting your input on a specific list of topics and questions that we'll get to after our presentation. Um, you'll also have the opportunity to submit general comments on the proposal using comment cards, um, which are available at the front. Uh, we have a court reporter here recording this meeting as well. For our webcast viewers, please email this email address to submit your comments. Um, for those of you here today in person, please make sure you checked in at the registration table and picked up an agenda and comment card, as well as the list of questions. Uh, now I'd like to introduce you to the panel representing our Safer Consumer Products Program. Um, here, first, we have Dr. Simona Balan, who is our senior environmental scientist and will be this afternoon's presenter. And next, we have Dr. Meredith Williams, who is our deputy director. And next to her, we have Carl Palmer, who is the branch chief. And then we have Andre Algazi, who is the chemical product evaluation team lead. Um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Dr. Williams, for opening remarks. Thank you, Asha. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, thank you all for being here in person, and thanks to those who are participating online. Um, we welcome you to this discussion uh, and for the beginning of an to continuation of an ongoing conversation. We want to continue the conversation we began last year on with this workshop on the per and polyfluoral alkyl substances in carpets and rugs. And I'm sure you're all well aware that we released a document last month that is a technical document that explains our basis for concern about these products. And that document was, was developed using, of course, extensive staff research, but also a, a great deal of engagement both from participants who are here today and from partners at the local, state, federal, and even international level who have been giving this set of chemicals and these products uh, a great deal of consideration. And yet, despite that, the great amount of research that went into this, this document, it's still just the relatively early part of our process. We're counting on additional input through the comments, um, and we use that input to, def to inform further deliberations about this combination of product and chemical. And as you're hopefully aware also, we extended the comment period on this document until April 16th, and that's to allow adequate time for thoughtful input and consideration of this highly complex and very technical document and um, topic. So we take comments quite seriously. We will take all the comments we, re we receive here today and through the, the formal comment period on CalSAFER um, under consideration. Um, as we decide whether to move forward with any rulemaking and um, in terms of developing a, a, the support for a potential priority product listing. So if we do go ahead with a priority product listing, we will initiate rulemaking, and that will provide, again, another comment, a more formal comment period and hearing. So this, is, this comment on this document as it is today would not be the last opportunity to engage with the department. And as always, with the Safer Consumer Products Program and regulations, even rulemaking does not provide some, any certainty about what the ultimate outcome is of a priority product listing. That really depends on the alternatives analysis that's undertaken by the manufacturers, by the findings of those alternative analyses, and um, the recommendations of the manufacturing sector. And that becomes the basis to dictate a path forward on this product chemical common combination. So um, with that, I think I'll be, have an opportunity to make a few comments at the end. Um, we're looking forward to the conversation today, and I will turn it over to Dr. Simona Balan. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, and thank you everyone for joining us today and for engaging with us in this process um, and on our proposal to list PFAS in carpets and rugs as a priority product. Oops. According to the Safer Consumer Product Regulations, a priority product is a product chemical combination that meets two key criteria. There must be potential for exposure to the candidate chemical in the product, and there must be potential for one or more of these exposures to cause or contribute to significant or widespread adverse impacts. And we discuss how these factors are met in great detail in our profile, which is available on CalSAFER for comment until April 16th. But today I'll just give you a brief overview of the definitions and scope of this proposal, and I'll summarize the evidence for the potential for exposure and the potential adverse impacts, and I'll end with a couple additional considerations. Okay, so the scope of the product, carpets and rugs, is any product made from natural or synthetic fabric that is intended to be used as a floor covering inside commercial or residential buildings. So that includes carpeted um, doormats because they can be used indoors or outdoors, but it excludes carpets and rugs in other interior environments such as cars, trains, or planes. Um, and here are the uh, relevant uh, product classification codes that we've identified. In terms of the class of chemical, the candidate chemicals, that's the entire class of perfluoroalkyl and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or PFASs. And they're a class of over 3,000 chemicals, highly diverse in terms of structure. Uh, there's polymers, non-polymers. Um, but what they have in common is that they all contain at least one fully fluorinated carbon atom. So one carbon that has no more carbon-hydrogen bonds because all the hydrogens were replaced with fluorine. And all our candidate chemicals for our program, they've been listed in 2015 by Biomonitor in California as uh, priority chemicals. They're used in a wide variety of consumer products. In carpets and rugs, they serve as uh, stain resistance and uh, soil resistance, including resistance to uh, oil and water-based stains. So this entire universe of PFASs that is highly diverse can be subdivided into four main categories, uh, according to a recent paper by Wang et al. 2017. We have the perfluoroalkyl acids, or PFAAs. These are the most widely studied, the best known out of this chemical class. Um, then there are PFA precursors, chemicals that degrade into PFAAs, fluoropolymers, and perfluoropolyethers. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about all of these four categories and how they relate to carpets and rugs. Um, but all of them basically, one way or another, connect back to PFAAs because they're either degrade to PFAAs or they're manufactured using PFAAs. So what are PFAAs? Um, they are perfluorinated chemicals. They're non-polymeric. The um, key concern with these chemicals is their extreme persistence. There's no known natural degradation pathway for these chemicals in the environment. So once they're out there in the environment, they can last indefinitely, maybe even longer than human civilization. They're also um, bioaccumulative, the, the ones that are longer chains, so um, sulfonates with six or more fluorinated carbons and all other PFAs with seven or more fluorinated carbons are called long chains um, because of their bioaccumulation potential. The shorter chain ones tend to be very mobile in the environment, and that's another um, key concern. And uh, toxicity has also been documented in both human and animal studies. Now, PFAs are not used in carpets and rugs. They're not intentionally added to carpets and rugs. However, they can be found in carpets and rugs as a manufacturing impurity or as a degradation product of the PFAs that are added to carpets and rugs. Which brings me to PFA precursors. These are probably the biggest subcategory of PFAs. Um, they're both polymers and non-polymers. They're mostly polyfluorinated, meaning that there's still carbon-hydrogen bonds in the molecule. And their key concern is that they degrade to PFAs. Um, some of them can also be persistent. They can still be in the environment for a while before they degrade to PFAs. Some are also very mobile. For instance, fluorotelomer alcohols are volatile and they can be transported in air throughout the globe. And uh, some, such as fluorotelomer carboxylates and aldehydes, were found to have greater acute toxicity than the PFAs. Now, the um, side chain fluorinated polymers, um, as the name describes, they're a long hydrocarbon chain with um, side chains um, that are fluorinated that can cleave off. So eventually, they do degrade into PFAs. 
Um, and they are the most commonly used carpet and rug treatment currently in North America. So they're highly relevant to this product category. Um, Non-polymeric PFA precursors have been used in carpets and rugs in the past, and they may still be used in imported products. And they may also be found in carpets and rugs uh, as uh, impurities or as um, incomplete degradation products of uh, the side chain fluorinated polymers. The last two categories, perfluoropolyethers and fluoropolymers, are uh, true polymers. They do not degrade, but they're also probably too big to get into the cell membranes uh, and cause toxicity. So the key concern here is that traditionally they've been manufactured using PFAAs. In fact, fluoropolymers have been the biggest source of perfluoroctanoic acid or PFOA to the environment, um, even though it's not um, manufactured generally with PFOA anymore, uh, they still use other PFAAs such as um, fluorinated ethers or Gen X. Um, and they're not as widely used in carpets and rugs. Um, we found a couple instances of perfluoropolyethers being used as carpet treatments. However, um, patent by Invista from 2017 says that PFAS is suitable for carpet and rug treatment includes fluoropolymers and perfluoropolyethers. Now, moving on to um, the potential for exposure, um, our regulations consider several different lines of evidence to determine this potential. So one of these lines of evidence is the market presence of the product. Carpets and rugs make up more than half of the market for flooring, according to 2016 data, both by revenue and by volume. Um, and according to the Carpet and Rug Institute, California is uh, about a third of the US carpet market um, and also most residential and commercial carpets are treated with PFASs. So it seems likely that the majority of Californians are going to be exposed to carpets containing PFASs during, um, on a pretty regular basis, either in their homes or in their offices or in other indoor buildings that they frequent. Another line of evidence we look at is monitoring data. And PFASs have been found in a wide variety of environmental media, including indoor air and dust, um, outdoor air, fresh water, ocean water, soil and sediment. They've been found in plants and animals and in pretty much all humans studied around the world, including in indigenous populations in the Arctic, far away from any emission sources. Um, they've also been found in human food, including vegetables, fish, meat, as well as in drinking water, including in California, um, in some places at levels exceeding US EPA health advisories. And please note that this monitoring data that we have on PFAS is, is limited to some PFAAs and some of their precursors. The majority of PFAS cannot currently be measured using current analytical techniques, so the extent of contamination may be even bigger than we know. Another line of evidence we look at are the properties of the chemicals, such as persistence. The more persistent a chemical is, the, gener the longer it's going to be in the environment, so the higher the likelihood of exposure and re-exposure for humans and, uh, and biota. So PFASs are very persistent. <coughs> um, another trait of concern is bioaccumulation. The longer chain PFAs bioaccumulate. And also lactational and transplacental transfer was displayed by uh, pretty much all PFASs tested for this property. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. So, for instance, um, the fetus gets exposed to PFASs in uterus, and babies are born with PFASs already in their bodies, and they get <coughs> additional loadings through breastfeeding. Excuse me. I knew that was going to happen. I'm recovering from a sickness. <laughs> Sorry about that. <coughs> So um, we also look at the um, exposure throughout the life cycle of the product, not just during the use phase. And this is not actually shown on this diagram, but during manufacturing, there can also be releases of PFASs to the environment while the carpets are being treated. And once the carpet has been put on the market and treated with PFASs, um, the non-polymeric PFASs can come out in uh, dust that then humans and animals can ingest or inhale. They can come out in air if they're volatile, that then humans and animals can inhale. Um, then there could also be dermal contact, right? If you get in contact with a carpet, um, that's especially a concern for toddlers that spend a, <clears throat> that spend a lot of time in contact with the carpet. Um, also, if the carpet is cleaned, the cleaning extract ends up in um, 
<clears throat> eventually at a wastewater treatment plant that is not necessarily set up to deal with these chemicals and they end up being released into the environment. And once they're in the environment, these chemicals cycle there forever since they don't get degraded. Um, <clears throat> so there's the possibility for multiple avenues of exposure and eventually can make it into human food and drinking water. And especially at the end of life, um, our regulations are concerned with what happens uh, in terms of adverse impacts at the end of life of a product or adverse impacts to waste management. So carpets typically are landfill at the end of their life. Uh, in California in 2016, 75% of the carpet discarded was landfilled. Um, so from landfill, any water that percolates through can carry these chemicals out in the leachate. That leachate may be directly released into surface and groundwater, or it can be brought to a wastewater treatment plant that cannot necessarily remove it. Um, removing PFAS is, is possible, but it's cost prohibited for most wastewater treatment plants, um, and it's not possible for all PFASs at the moment, as far as we know. Now, the other carpets and rugs that are not landfilled are either incinerated for energy recovery or are recycled. And that leads to recyclers being exposed to these chemicals and also to the perpetration of PFASs in the recycled product. We also consider three kinds of hazard traits of the candidate chemicals, exposure potential, environmental, and toxicological hazard traits. These exposure potential hazard traits listed on the left of the slide are displayed by different PFASs. Not all of them meet all of those, but um, different PFASs display all of these. And I've talked about the first four. Um, the last one, global warming potential, is displayed by some fluorinated ethers and by an incomplete combustion product of PFASs. Um, and some PFASs also show toxicity to plants and to other terrestrial and aquatic organisms. And in terms of toxicological hazard traits, there are numerous epidemiological studies that have looked at um, adverse impacts to humans, including uh, kidney and testicular cancer, increased serum cholesterol, thyroid disease, immune dysregulation, including um, reduced e efficacy of vaccines and higher incidence of uh, infectious diseases for children, and uh, pregnancy-induced hypertension. So. Um, these effects were mostly found for longer chain PFASs because they were studied for this, but the shorter chains are starting to show similar impacts as well in more recent studies. Uh, PFASs accumulate in human lungs, um, kidney, liver, brain, bone tissue, basically anything that is very protein rich. A whole suite of other hazard traits were um, found in animal studies and um, appendix three to the profile list some of these studies, but please note that they're not comprehensive, right? There's, there's hundreds of studies out there. We did not try to be comprehensive there. We just tried to show kind of the breadth of research that exists for these chemicals. And um, we also pay special attention to um, effects on uh, sensitive subpopulations, endangered species, sensitive habitats in California, uh, including the human populations that are typically most susceptible to hazardous chemicals, such as fetuses, infants, children, pregnant women. Um, but exposure to PFASs in carpets and rugs is of concern to anyone who is uh, in close contact with, with uh, PFASs in carpets for uh, their work, such as uh, carpet installers, carpet cleaners, carpet retail sector workers, carpet recyclers, as well as office workers or school children who are indoors most of the time. Um, it can also be a cause of concern for people who have certain pre-existing conditions like high cholesterol or thyroid disease or other diseases that are similar to those associated with the use of PFASs. So um, lastly, a couple more thoughts, uh, data gaps. Right. Um, despite the thousands of papers out there on PFASs, there are quite a few data gaps remaining, and uh, we discuss some of them in the profile. We hope we can fill some of them with your help either today or through this comment period. Um, but please note that despite the data gaps, there is still sufficient information for DTSC to make this proposal to list PFASs in carpets and rugs as a priority product. And lastly, we also looked at alternatives. Um, alternatives are already available for most uses of uh, PFASs in carpets and rugs, um, including inherently stain-resistant fibers that may not need any chemical treatment, as well as a whole range of chemical alternatives. Uh, sulfonation is one that has been used for a while. It blocks 
the um, acid dye sites on the nylon so that the carpet then is impossible to stain using coffee or wine or anything that is acidic. It doesn't work for all types of stains, but it works for acidic stains. Um, there's a bunch of other different alternatives that have been developed and are listed here in the profile, but please know that DTSC has not assessed these alternatives and we're not endorsing any particular formulation. So please, uh, if you haven't yet, take a look at the profile. It's available on CalSAFER for comment until 11.59 p.m. on April 16th. And uh, we look forward to hearing your comments. If you'd like to stay engaged with us, here's our contact information. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to hearing from you today and throughout this comment period. So I'll pass it back on to Asha. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation, Dr. Balan. Uh, now we'd like to switch it over to public comment. Uh, first, we'd like to seek your input on specific questions that we have posted on our CalSAFER website, also available to pick up at the table. Um, you can find the link posted on our workshop information page as well. I'll go through each of these one by one. Um, let's get to that slide here. Um, if you have a comment that is unrelated to these specific questions, then please hold them for the next comment session that will follow. Uh, for this process, in-person attendees do not need to fill out a comment card. Uh, we'll be taking your comment cards for the general comment period after this session. Um, so I'd like to go ahead and get started um, on the topic of product and chemical um, description. Our first question is, is the product definition clear and unambiguous as to which related products are included or excluded? Um, is there anyone in this room that would like to comment on this question? Do we have any webcast attendees with a comment? Okay, then we'll move on to the second question. Are the global product classification and North American industry classification system codes relevant and comprehensive? Does anyone have any comments in this room? None from the webcast? Okay, we'll move on to the third question then. Um, is the definition of the class of PFASs clear and accurate? Anyone in this room with a comment? Webcast? Okay. Um, before we move on to the next category, um, I'll just take one last moment to ask if anyone has any questions on this category. Okay, we'll move on to the next topic then. Okay, um, so this, these questions are about the potential exposures and impacts. So our first question is, um, if anyone has more specific data on the market presence, of the product and its supply chain. One in this room with a comment. Webcast. Okay, uh, we'll move on to the second question. Um, we'd like to know um, if you have information on the release, loss, or degradation rate of the PFAS-based treatment of carpets and rugs. With comments. Okay, um, our third question is, what is the scientific basis for claims that lower toxicity is indicated by lower apparent bioaccumulation, persistence, or long-term body burden? No comments? Okay, we'll move on to our next slide here. A couple more questions on this topic. Um, a fourth question is, what additional research is industry doing to address global concerns on the persistence of PFASs in the environment and potential human and ecological health impacts? Anyone? Right. Okay, our fifth question on this topic is, 
what methods are used for handling and disposing of PFAS waste and PFAS containing carpet and rug pre and post consumer waste. Okay. Um, we don't have any comments on this topic, uh, potential exposures and impacts. We'll move on to the next topic. Okay, so now we're moving on to the topic of alternatives. Uh, would like to know if you have any information on the alternatives listed in the profile as well as any information you have on alternatives that are not listed. Um, again, we'll just go through these one by one. Um, our first question is, do you have further information on the alternatives listed in Chapter 7 of the product chemical profile? All right. No comments. All right. Um, we'll move on to our second question, which is, are there other functionally acceptable alternatives to the use of PFASs in carpets and rugs? Um, in particular, uh, are they commercially available? Anyone have comments? Second, uh, do they require the use of a replacement chemical? Any comments? Third, uh, are there known hazards associated with these alternatives? Okay, and um, are any potential replacement chemicals listed as candidate chemicals? Any comments? Okay, so that concludes our portion of the comment specifically focused on our questions. Now we would like to open it up to general comments. Um, we have a few comment cards that we've received. Um, Chris, you've got some comment cards for us. Um, if you could go ahead and bring it up, that'd be great. We'll just move on into our next session. Okay, we have uh, seven comment cards. Um, I'll go ahead and call up our first speaker, and that would be Jessica Bowman from the Flora Council. Go ahead and come up to the mic, and um, you have no more than five minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm Jessica Bowman with the Flora Council. Uh, first, I just want to say that we appreciate the opportunity to provide comments on the profile document, um, both at this workshop and through written comments. I also want to say that we appreciate the opportunity uh, that we've had over the last year and a half to have a dialogue with the department um, as you've worked to better understand PFAS um, and their use in carpets and rugs. However, I must say that we were deeply disappointed in the document, uh, especially to find out that much of the information that we provided to the department regarding the primary PFAS that are actually used in carpeting today and have been in use for more than a decade, those are short chain, side chain fluorinated polymers, has not been included in the profile document. We think the doc document is fundamentally flawed from both a factual and a scientific basis, and that the concerns raised in the document regarding potential adverse impacts and exposure are based almost wholly on PFOA and PFOS. PFOA and PFOS are not used in carpeting today. The PFAS that are used in carpeting today are not a relevant source of these substances. And there's a robust body of data, much of which we've provided to the department that was not included in the profile document that shows the concerns associated with PFOS and PFOA are not characteristic of the entire class of PFAS or the specific PFAS that are used in carpeting today. In the profile document, the department has documented its concerns with PFOA and PFOS from both a hazard and an exposure standpoint. And as I conveyed at the January 2017 workshop on this matter, these substances continue to be manufactured outside the US by companies that didn't participate in the uh, EPA PFOA stewardship program. And therefore, articles containing these substances can be and continue to be imported legally to the US. So if the department does, in fact, 
have concerns about these substances, about PFOA and PFOS, then we would encourage you to take a closer look at other applications where they continue to be used today, rather than focusing on an industry, on an application that over 10 years ago switched away from long chains. We will be submitting detailed written comments by the April 16th deadline, but in the meantime, we want to offer several high-level high level points for the department to consider. I'm going to introduce those points, and a couple of my colleagues will discuss them in more detail. First, DTSC cannot and has not demonstrated widespread adverse impacts for all PFAS chemicals. Second, DTSC should acknowledge that only a limited subset of PFAS are actually used in carpeting today. Those are primarily short-chain, side-chain fluorinated polymers. And finally, there's a robust body of degradation, toxicity, and exposure data on those short-chain, side-chain fluorinated polymers that demonstrates a lack of widespread adverse impacts from those chemistries that are actually used in carp to treat carpeting today. So with that, I think we have it in order, so my colleagues will speak right after me. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. Uh, next, we have Steve Korzanowski from the Flora Council. Okay. We'll take Warren then next. <laughs> then Steve, you'll get Steve later. All right. So thank you all. Um, as Jessica mentioned, uh, I'm going to pick up on two points that she raised. Uh, the first is that uh, DTSE, we think, cannot make the determination of widespread uh, adverse impacts from the entire class of PFAS chemicals. Um, and as we saw in the earlier presentation, the term PFAS describes a very broad category of chemistry that encompasses hundreds of products that are currently in commerce, as well as hundreds, hundreds of other substances that are no longer in commerce uh, or present as waste products or impurities or only in the laboratory. Uh, the universe of chemistry can be divided into several different categories, including fluoropolymers, side chain fluorinated polymers, fluorosurfactants, and poly, uh, um, and perfor perfluoropolyethers. Um, these chemistries have widely differing physical and chemical properties and very different toxicological profiles. Um, and also very diverse uh, performance characteristics. And because of this very broad diversity, it would be inappropriate, scientifically incorrect, and ultimately an arbitrary decision to address, quote, all PFAS chemicals as if they were a single class of closely re related chemicals because the data show that's not correct. While some subclasses of PFAS chemicals might be associated with potentially adverse impacts, other subclasses of PFAS chemistries are clearly not associated with adverse impacts. One example is fluoropolymers. These are very large molecules that are chemically and biologically inert and are not bioavailable. The overwhelming weight of scientific evidence supports the conclusion that fluoropolymers do not present any significant risks to human health or the environment. These, datas, these data have been collected in a peer-reviewed scientific paper that is currently in press and available online in pre-publication format in integrated environmental assessment and management. Similarly, a large and growing body of scientific data also supports the conclusion that short-chain, side-chain fluorinated polymers currently on the market in the U.S. do not present any significant risks to human health or the environment. Before these products were allowed onto the market, EPA undertook an in-depth review of the data supporting the safety of these products. And in addition, EPA continues to retain regulatory oversight of these products through its use of TSCA Section 5E orders. As OECD and other scientific bodies have noted, when multiple chemicals have differing toxicity characteristics, they cannot be grouped together for risk assessment purposes. This is true of the large and diverse universe of PFAS chemistries. The overwhelming weight of scientific evidence demonstrates that different categories of chemistries within the broad PFAS universe have widely differing toxicological profiles. Therefore, it is inappropriate to regulate all so-called PFAS chemicals as a single class. More to the point, this, with specific reference to the Safer Consumer Products Regulation, DTSC cannot in good faith determine that the entire universe of PFAS chemistries presents adverse impacts in the state of California. The scientific data simply do not support such a determination. The second, second issue I'd like to address is that 
um, as Jessica mentioned, side chain fluorinated polymers, specifically those uh, that are short chain, um, uh, are the specific category that is overwhelmingly used in carpeting. Uh, and the only other uh, alternative that we're aware of is the perfluoro polyether. Uh, the sole focus of the chemical assessment profile uh, should be on these materials, their impurities, and their degradants. These materials are considered low risk to humans in the environment, and it is incorrect and extremely misleading to associate these actual carpet treatment materials with PFAS chemicals that show evidence of toxic effects. These, these materials that are actually in use have not been associated with toxic endpoints for carcinogenic carcinogenicity, developmental toxicity, mutagenicity, or reproductive toxicity. Floor Council members represent the majority of fluorinated treatments sold into carpets in the U.S. and have considerable expertise in this application. The vast majority of PFAS materials used in carpet are side chain fluorinated polymers with short chains, as I mentioned. The only other PFAS material, again, as I mentioned, are the perfluoropolyethers. Long chain fluorinated polymers Fluorinated products like C8 and PFOA and related products that were discussed extensively in the profile document are not used and no longer even produced in the United States. Fluoropolymers, despite what is indicated in the profile document, are not used in carpet applications. Polymerization aids like GenX and Adana, which were discussed extensively in the profile document, are simply not suitable for this use and, and, and have never been used in carpeting. Short chain fluorosurfactants, likewise, are not used in carpet treatment. They're not suitable for this end use. There's no credible evidence of the use or presence of PFAS chemicals other than short chain based polymers and perfluoropolyethers. Any observations of the presence of other materials would be as unintended contaminants of the test methods or the materials. Only the short chain based polymers are used and only these materials and their impurities and degradants should be considered relevant in the focus of the DTSC profile document. Fluorinated side chain polymers and degradation products are considered low risk to humans in the environment. These polymers are not bioavailable and are considered low risk and it is incorrect and uh, extremely misleading to state that the degradation products of these short chain side chain polymers show evidence for carcinogenicity, developmental toxicity, mutagenicity, or reproductive toxicity, and so forth. The toxic endpoints for long chains, such as PFOA and PFOS, listed in the profile document have not been associated with the polymers, monomers, or degradation products of the PFAS chemicals actually used in carpeting today. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. Okay, we'll move on to Steve Korzanowski with the Floral Council. Thank you very much. I want to spend just a few moments more on the technical side. Um, I represent the Floral Council, but I represent the, the science work group of the Floral Council. Uh, part of the work that we do every day is to, to try to understand what work has been done, what it means, and so on, not unlike what you've done, um, uh, Simona. I want to talk about four things. I want to first talk about degradation, uh, degradation of the C6 um, products and the other fluorotelomer-based products. Um, there's the concept out there of irreversible exposure and forever chemicals, and I think we're all familiar with that. However, um, recently completed studies on the C6 short chain fluorotelomer-based polymers, the acrylates and methacrylates, uh, conducted under US EPA directed and approved protocols uh, indicate that the current half-life uh, T1 halves are on the order of millennia. Uh, as we saw in the document, there's a, there's a rather an overt um, uh, bias toward the John Washington and uh, uh, Al study that looks at maybe decades. But we present additional evidence that it's uh, likely different than that. Degradation pathways for fluorotelomer intermediates and precursors, such as the 6,2 fluorotelomer alcohol, are well known and well studied, and the respective studies published in peer review literature. Regardless of the exact short chain fluorotelomer based products that were used in carpets and rugs, uh, potential degradation products and impurities ultimately result in dead end and stable short chain acids like the C6 and the C4. The hazard profile of fluorinated polymers used in carpeting is assessed based on their degradation products. 
At the, at the direction of regulatory agencies, the most well-studied of those degradation products is perfluorohexanoic hexanoic acid, although data is available on other degradation products. Speaking of the C6 acid, uh, some of the safety data on the C6 acid is published, peer-reviewed, and been out the literature for many years. It is well studied with a large body of, body of data published in the open literature. This data has demonstrated that the C6 acid is not carcinogenic, has not exhibited DNA mutation or genotox effects in several studies, is not an endocrine disruptor, does not exhibit adverse impacts on reproduction, development, uh, at, at doses, even at higher doses than other, other studies. And studies where effects have been observed, and as, as those that do toxicology do understand that studies are often done to, sh to show effects. The only effects that were shown were at the high doses. We'll talk about C6 exposure, the C6 acid exposure, because again, that's a, a, a central part of, of, the, of this document about potential exposure uh, to humans and, and animals. Data gaps regarding, regarding the levels of the C6 acid in the environment and human syrup, they do exist. Uh, and they do exist because the C6 acid has generally been excluded from environmental monitoring surveys and blood serum analyses due to low frequency of detection and low levels of detection compared to other associated method detection limits. This is the stated reason why the C6 acid was not included in EPA's unregulated contaminant monitoring rule and in CDC studies, the NHANES. The available data consistently shows extremely low frequencies of detection and low levels of detection for the C6 acid in both environmental media and in human populations. Biomonitoring studies consistently demonstrate that the C6 acid is infrequently detected in human serum, particularly compared with most other perfluoralkyl acids. And one, one point of note, a, a study was published in 2017. Um, in all exposure analyses, one should also consider the reference dose for the C6 acid of 0.32 milligrams per kilogram per day for the C6 acid, derived by ANSES, the French agency, uh, um, uh, an august body of, of toxicologists and, and other folks in 2017. Now that reference dose is four orders of magnitude higher, safer than PFOA, for example. I want to finish with one last, one last item. And again, I think that one of the biggest issues that we're facing today, of course, is these chemicals get into the environment. And the question is, when they do, can you get them out? And I think the, the general thinking is that once short chains get in the environment, you can't get them out. I think you can't use carbon, you can't use this, you can't use that. Fact of the matter is, short chain alkyl acids like, such as the C6 acid can be removed from source water to meet drinking water standards. Water treatment technologies and commercial use utilize a variety of removal technologies, and some would call it a treatment train. Commercial systems were most recently described by Arcadis, Wood, ECT2, Tursus, EA Engineering, and others at the Emerging Contaminants Summit held March 6th and 7th in Westminster, Colorado, a couple weeks ago, which I and many of my colleagues attended. Technologies deployed include granulated carbon, superfine carbon, ion exchange, ozone fractionation, reverse osmosis, and polymeric absorbance. And with that, thank you very much. Turn that over to Joe Yarbrough, right? Thanks for Thank your you. comments. <laughs> All right, Joe, you're next uh, with the Carpet and Rug Institute. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Joe Yarbrough. I'm the president of the Carpet and Rug Institute. Uh, it's my privilege to be here with you today. Uh, I'd like to state that the Carpet and Rug Institute is the trade association for the manufacturers of carpet, and we represent uh, more than 90% of the carpet that's produced uh, in the United States. I just want to begin by saying that carpet manufacturers have long led the way uh, in creating products that are safe, sustainable, and beautiful for home, schools, and commercial spaces. Many years ago, our CRI members voluntarily stopped the use of what are known as long-chain perfluorinated uh, compounds, that is C8 uh, chains and higher. These were substituted to further ensure safe and environmentally sound methods of protecting carpets from soiling and liquid stains were employed. Now, while some of the products today are not treated with uh, side chain base floor chemistries, certain applications, uh, those products are suitable for the in use expectation of the customers for that. But as we uh, stated uh, numerous times in our, our presentation in January of 2017, there are many product applications that require that 
the only compounds that we are aware of that will satisfy or provide the performance characteristics are the now utilized short chain perfluorinated chemical compounds. Uh, it's been clearly stated by my preceding speakers that uh, side chain polymer fluorochemistry employed in carpeting is unlike many of the more than 3,000 chemicals that you've identified in your own report. And looking at them as a general class, we think is, is flawed uh, pursuit of, of that, uh, that objective. Secondly, uh, the carpet industry was completely transitioned from long so-called long chain floor chemistries by 2007. That transition process began as early as 2003. Now this is relevant because one of the obligations that the carpet industry has through a stewardship program under CARE is to achieve a 24% recycling rate by uh, January of 2020. Um, we are concerned that there can be unintended consequences of our ability to achieve a statute if these products are identified in a way that uh, is unduly causing concern about the ability to recycle these materials. Now it's important to understand the life cycle of carpet. Seven to 12 years is typical for carpet installations. Now some shorter, some longer, but generally seven to 12 years is an accepted uh, life cycle for installed carpet. As, as I said, we've completely transitioned to short chain by 2007. So that means that by and large, all the carpeting that's being recycled today, those materials that are being pulled up, if they were treated with floor chemistry, they would be treated with floor chemistry that is of the short chain variety. And I implore you to consider that fact as you think about calling a carpet product a priority product for these reasons. Uh, the, the importance of recycling is very significant to our carpet industry. As I said, we've long led the way in environmental leadership and we wanna make sure that we're doing everything we can to achieve the sustainable practices of dealing with post-consumer carpet in an effective and important way. And it is our objective to accomplish that. Finally, uh, I'd just like to echo one other thing that uh, Jessica Bowman mentioned, and that is that imported product, and in the state of California, there is significant imported product. I don't have the statistics to validate what the, what the quantities are, but I, I believe that there are substantial amounts of, of broadloom carpeting and carpet tiles being imported into the state of California, and we voluntarily are making sure we're doing everything we can to provide products that are safe and environmentally sound. I cannot speak for those others who are in unregulated environments where they may not have the same objectives and or focus that our industry has held for, for decades. So I would implore you to concentrate as we ask in January of 2017 to be more specifically focused on not domestically produced product, but that that's being imported from, from offshore. That concludes my remarks, thank you. Thanks for your comments. Next, we have Miriam rotkin Elman from the Natural Resources Defense Council. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks so much for the opportunity to comment. Um, as, as stated, my name is Miriam rodkin Elman, and I'm a scientist with the Natural Resources Defense Council. And as an environmental advocacy organization, we have no financial interest in the subject of these comments that we have submitted or the comments that I'm going to be providing today. I want to thank the uh, staff of the Safer Consumer Products Program for a very impressive and comprehensive look at and review of a large class of chemicals with a global footprint. Um, the opportunity for California to be a leader in providing public health protections is front and center in my mind today, and my comments are aimed at, to, at moving California into a place of leadership toward addressing what is a global contamination problem from this class of chemicals. I apologize, I also am getting over <coughs> a respiratory problem, and um, I'll do my best. Um, I'm going to cut my main points today. Um, the priority profile provides ample evidence that the PFA, PFAS chemicals in carpets and rugs meet criteria for the Safer Consumer Products Program listing as a priority product. Um, it is critical that product listings cover the entire class, not only to make sure that we are addressing all 
today, contaminants that we see today and in the future, and that we are not ending up in a cycle of regrettable substitutions. The opportunity to head that off is now. We've already seen that extensively with this class of chemicals. We should not be aimed at any regulatory ac actions that further that practice. And lastly, while I appreciate the thorough discussion of data gaps, it is important to distinguish those types of data which contribute to risk analyses not required to meet the listing criteria. These gaps should not impede moving forward with developing regulatory language, um, and any further refinement of this profile should make this distinction clear. So to go into those points with a little bit more detail, as noted, we have those two main criteria for listing. Um, from the, we, from the, the priority product, the profile here gives extensive documentation of widespread exposure that, um, and does a, sorry, do you need that? Sorry. <laughs> product um, for specific studies which link the contaminants to different exposure routes and contamination in the environment at large. Um, it's important to note that the, these connections are very clear for both the use of the product for workers and also for life cycle and disposal. Each of those on their own meet the criteria in the safer consumer product um, listing requirements and then collectively provide significant and ample support for the listing. There's you know, extensive documentation of the toxicity information that we know highlighted in this profile. But I want to highlight that increasingly scientific experts are flagging toxicity concern not only with PFOA and PFOS chemicals. And the scientific community is raising the flag that we should not be waiting for those effects that we have seen in some of these other compounds to show up in epidemiologic studies. In order to see them in epidemiologic studies, you have to have widespread contamination. That is not a public health protective pathway forward, and the scientific community is joining together to, to argue that the indication that these chemicals may operate in similar fashion is sufficient for addressing them regulatorily. And then lastly, to be more specific on um, the profile ID to data gap specifically the language was full characterization of the duration, frequent, frequency, and level of population exposures has not been well characterized. That information is needed for risk analyses, is needed for setting standards, but is not relevant for the criteria associated with setting and, and should be um, indicated as such. Um, the, um, I want to close just by returning to the question of regrettable substitutions. We, again, this, this action by California has the opportunity to lead to address a global contamination issue. Um, and we should be taking all steps towards addressing the problem holistically and setting us up to drive towards California as a leadership in developing alternatives and not on contributing to regrettable substitutions. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next, we have Alvaro Palacios Casanova with Center for Environmental Health. Sure. <clears throat> so hello, everybody. My name is Alvaro Palacios Casanova. I'm the California Policy Manager at the Center for Environmental Health. CH is a national nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting people from harmful chemicals and consumer products, the environment, and our food. And we thank the Department of Toxic Substances Control for conducting a chemical product profile on per polyfluoro alcohol substances in carpets and rugs. CH is here to express support for the listing of PFAS in carpets and rugs as a priority product because we believe the product chemical combination meets a criteria for potential widespread exposure and adverse impacts to public health and the environment. The scientific evidence cited in the product profile shows widespread PFAS contamination in soils, plants, and in particular water, with an estimated 6 million Americans being affected by water contamination that exceeds EPA's advisory levels for PFAS in drinking water. PFAS contamination is so widespread that one study, which is in the product profile, stated that there is no unexposed control population. The product profile also provides evidence that PFAS are persistent chemicals that accumulate in the environmental media and organisms. Studies show that PFAS can harm fish and other marine organisms as they bioaccumulate and concentrate throughout the food chain, with certain PFAS chemicals causing malformations in fish. In addition, the PFAS chemicals 
being widespread and impacting aquatic ecosystems, there's evidence that the indoor built environment with rugs and carpets have elevated levels of PFAS and air and dust, exposing vulnerable populations like children and such subpopulations such as office workers. Lastly, CEH would like to thank you for considering PFAS as a class of chemicals in this product profile. PFAS has a similar chemical structure to their predecessors, PFAS and PFOA, and the current, um, current data that exists indicates that PFAS have similar properties to those chemicals. Therefore, we support PFAS being considered as a class of chemicals in this prior product listing. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next, we have Lisa Grandia from UC Davis, Woodland Coalition for Green Schools. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Liza Grandia. I am a professor at UC Davis in Native American Studies, uh, Mellon New Directions Fellow, working to connect communities with environmental health scientists. I am founder and coordinator of the Woodland Coalition for Green Schools. Um, but I'm here really more in my civic hat. It's funny. I'm actually a Georgia girl, but I'm not here to speak on behalf of the carpet industry. Rather, I want to applaud you for the courageous action that I hope you will take to begin to regulate this uh, industry. Um, I'm really here to speak to the canaries um, as a mother, as a cancer survivor. Um, and I want to thank you for noting, Dr. Balan, the uh, disproportionate impact on native populations. And I also want to re-emphasize that carpet is the number one source of exposure, according to Arlene Blum at UC Berkeley, uh, of this class of chemicals in children. Why? Right? We know. They're rug rats. They spend most of their time near and close to the floor. They jump around and produce a lot of dust. The hand-to-mouth gestures. Um, uh, uh, increase the concentration of, of, of exposure in children. And I just want to, in, in addition to those behavioral characteristics that we always need to think about in sensitive populations, is to emphasize that there are also institutional issues, whether in hospitals or in schools. The squirt, uh, many of you have children know from common core testing, right? They're, they don't even have time to be allowed to wash their hands. Um, so every day, children, whatever they've gotten on their hands, they put into their mouths at lunch because they're not given an opportunity to wash their hands. Um, and yet, you can put these chemicals in carpet and call it green label. How can a carpet with forever chemicals that will stick around in children's bodies ever be labeled as green? My first experience with green label carpet was 10 years ago. Actually, I was thinking about that when I was driving here today. I started chemotherapy today, 10 years ago after having an aggressive lymphoma induced in a sick building that sickened nearly a third of my, the faculty at my first university and whose indoor air quality problems we trace back to carpet. That experience induced me with multiple chemical sensitivity. What was it in carpet that did that to me? I don't know. I know that I can, I'm having a hard time breathing in this room. My heart is racing. I feel very ill in this room and in all places with carpet after that experience. What was in it? I don't know. We had this very interesting report by the Healthy Building Network about potentially 44 hazardous substances in carpet. I guess I shouldn't have to prove what's making me sick. You should have to prove that it's safe. I applaud you, um, California EPA, for taking this action 25 years after the US EPA capitulated to the carpet industry and the Green Label program. Um, as I was trying to find a reason for my illness, what's in carpet? Like we something that we're surrounded by cradle to grave. You don't think it could be dangerous. It's soft. We put our children on it to play. How could it be dangerous? We've become so used to it that we don't think about its potential hazard. Well, interestingly, the EPA in 1987 to 1988, as it installed new carpet at its DC Waterside headquarters, as the rugs rolled out, roughly 600 staff and scientists, about a fifth of the workforce um, fell ill. Then of those, about 60 people became so hypersensitized they could not return to work in the building. Investigations showed the common denominator in that case might have been a chemical called 4PC, 4-phenylcyclohexene, that is known, they thought, at parts as low as 10 parts per billion to induce hypersensitivity. In that case, the EPA scientist, after two years of struggle and um, multiple tomes of research, recommended that the agency set a regulatory level for 4PC at less than 10 parts per billion. 
the carpet industry countered with a voluntary proposal to self-police at 300 parts per million. You don't have to be a mathematician to note the difference. Um, that's how the green label was born in 1992. And after that, regulators never tried to confront the, the carpet industry again. So I thank you for your courage. I am here as a citizen. I knew that there would be the carpet industry here. And I knew that you also needed to hear about people who were affected by carpet. Down the road in Woodland, in our school district, we have dozens of children who have been sickened by a carpet installation in classrooms this year. We don't know what's causing it, but we do know that the children are sick, coming home with red eyes and headaches every day. Um, it's been 25 years since the EPA had its own carpet crisis. Um, and um, I think it's wonderful that we're finding out at least about one of the many chemicals in carpet. Um, and I encourage you to move forward with this and then continue to look at what else might have been swept under the rug. Um, thank you. Thanks for your comments. Uh, the last comment card I have from our in-person attendees is from Tom Brunton for the uh, Green Science Policy Institute. Good afternoon. My name is Tom Bruton, and I'm a scientist at the Green Science Policy Institute. Our institute's mission is to facilitate responsible use of chemicals to protect human and environmental health. And I'm here today to express, express our strong support for the proposal to list carpet and rugs with PFAS as priority products. I've read through the DTSC's draft priority product profile, and I found it to be a well-researched synthesis of the science on this class of chemicals, and I want to commend the department uh, for doing such a thorough job on this. The draft profile shows clearly that PFAS and carpets and rugs meet the two key criteria of the Safer Consumer Products regulations. One, that they result in the potential for public or environmental exposure, and two, that those exposures have the potential to contribute to or cause significant or widespread adverse impact. Furthermore, I believe that there are compelling scientific and practical reasons for treating the entire group of per- and polyfluoroalkyl substances as a class. PFOA, PFAS, and other long-chain perfluoroalkyl acids are the most well-studied PFAS from an environmental and toxicological standpoint. And as a result of what's known about their adverse effects, they've been phased out by many manufacturers. Now, some stakeholders have made the point that PFAS are a diverse class of chemicals and that many of the PFAS in use today differ from PFOA and PFOS in important ways. One common argument is that short-chain PFAS are not biopersistent and that therefore they're environmentally preferable. Human biomonitoring studies typically measure PFAS in blood plasma, and while it's true that the short-chain perfluoroalkyl acids do not accumulate in plasma to the extent that the long chains do, this alone is not sufficient evidence to conclude that there is no cause for concern. The short chain compounds have been less well studied and some recent research does raise red flags. For instance, studies in both live mice and human uh, autopsy tissue have detected short chain PFAS in several organs other than blood, including at concentrations higher than the long chains. Another study published just last fall showed that the short chain PFHXA was not detected when scientists looked for it in blood serum, uh, but it was found in 100% of whole blood samples. And all of this suggests that there's reasons for concern about the short-chain PFAS. Uh, and this is important because they're the ultimate degradation products of many of the chemistries currently used to treat carpets. Another argument is that fluoropolymers like PTFE and PVDF are uh, a distinct subgroup of chemicals that ought not to be lumped in with the other PFAS. While it's true that fluoropolymers have a high molecular weight and are not likely to be bioavailable themselves, their manufacture requires the use of problematic fluorinated monomers, such as PFOA, and Gen X. Because the Safer Consumer Products regulations allow for consideration of life cycle impacts, it's logical to include fluoropolymers in the PFAS class. Finally, uh, the fact that there are thousands of different PFAS in use means that it's impractical to evaluate the safety of these chemicals one at a time. A large number of academic, government, and NGO scientists from around the world feel that the evidence against this class of chemicals is strong enough to merit limiting their production and use. The Green Science Policy Institute applauds the work of DTSC to protect the health of Californians, including the proposed listing of PFAS and carpets and rugs. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. Um, we have a few comments that came in through webcast, so we'll go through those next.
Our first comment uh, from Stacy Tatman. In the technical document and in today's presentation, autos are said to be excluded. Does that also include aftermarket or replacement parts for autos, such as floor mats? Does anyone want, from the panel want to respond? In the technical document and in today's presentation, autos are said to be excluded. Does that include aftermarket or replacement parts for autos such as floor mats? Okay. Thank you. For, uh, yes, was the answer. <laughs> okay, our next comment from webcast from Miriam Gordon. Did you investigate potential releases of PFASs from waste to energy? No, we didn't look into details about, we did not research that topic in detail, no. Our next comment also from Miriam Gordon. Um, carpet pads question. Did you look into carpet pads from waste textiles, some of its carpet fibers, and whether these should be regulated too? Are there members of the industry who can speak to whether waste carpet fiber is being used in carpet pads and which carpets? Since AB 1158 requires carpet industry to reach a 24% recycling rate, how can the Fluoro Council say that the discontinued use of long chain PFASs means that these chemicals are not going to persist in carpet? Old carpets being recycled into new ones likely contain the PFOS and PFOA used more than 10 years ago. Uh, given their persistence, uh, PFOA and PFOS are likely to be recycled into carpet products and other products for years to come and stain these products through their life cycle. I think there's a question in there about did we consider um the pads, and I think the answer is no, we didn't specifically look at pads. Mr. Thanks. Just okay, our last question from the webcast is uh, from Hardy Sullivan. At last year's workshop, the Flora Council reported 99% of the PFOA in the environment came from sources other than side chain, long chain fluorinated polymers, and 0% of PFOA and PFOS came from side chain, short chain fluorinated polymer. Why is uh, DTSC focusing on stain-resistant treatments rather than the primary sources? Consider that removal of this fiber protection will shorten the life of carpet, leading to premature replacement of carpet. This will increase water consumption, increase consumption of non-renewable fossil fuels or pesticides to produce fibers, increase landfill, increase greenhouse gas emissions, and increase costs. Um, let me just say that, um, that the exercise of evaluating a potential priority product is not the same as doing a complete alternatives analysis. And so the criteria that we're required to look at are very clear in terms of some, can we nominate and uh, address and list something as a priority product. Um, at that point, once it's listed, then you go into the alternatives analysis process, which is when those different types of potential impacts throughout the whole life cycle of the product would be addressed. So that it's important that when you look at the profile that, that you look at our regulations, uh, which specify the criteria that DTSC is held to in terms of making that determination. And it's not the same as those requirements in Article 5, which are for the alternatives analysis. So. Thank you. Uh, we have one more comment from the webcast, and this is from Heather Covert. Is the boundary for carpet and rugs interior to the home, or would this also include interior to offices, hotels, hospitals, etc.? What about outdoor rugs and carpets? So it includes um, all carpets that are inside buildings. So that could be hospitals. Yes, all those buildings mentioned, but not outdoor carpets. And that has to do with the product categories in our work plan. Um, this work is based on the 2015-2017 work plan. So we have there the indoor built environment and uh, um, home and uh, office furnishings um, as the relevant categories. All right, thank you.
comment from our webcast uh, viewer, Stacy Tatman, and a follow-up question. Although it is clearly stated that autos are exempt, does this exemption include trucks, vans, and other vehicles? Yes. Yes, it includes all vehicles, Just, again, because they're not covered in any product category in our work plan. So anything that's out of the scope of the work plan is out of the scope of this proposal. Any last comments from our in-person attendees? Any last comments from our webcast viewers? Do we have any closing remarks? Yes, thanks, Asha. Great, thanks. Um, so again, um, Meredith was going to do this, but she got called to a higher calling, so I'll, I'll fill in. First uh, and foremost, thank you for your participation today. Thank you for everyone here in the room that gave us comments and then listened. Um, also, thanks to everyone online who's paying attention and uh, providing comment. Um, I want to stress that, um, as Meredith said earlier, this is still part of the, the dialogue is ongoing. So it's important to us. Uh, I'll note that no one responded to the questions that we laid out. That does not prevent you from responding to those questions formally in, uh, by submitting them to CalSAFER prior to April 16th, the end of, at the end of the day at April 16th. And additionally, you can provide whether comments you uh, care to on, uh, by that time on our, our profile. The other thing I'd like to do is just uh, emphasize to folks that uh, this is a regulatory process, but we haven't regulated anything yet. You need to look at our regulations to look at the criteria uh, and the requirements in the regulations which dictate our decision making here at DTSC in terms of this step of the process, which is proposing and listing a priority product. Uh, further than that, once a product is listed, then you need to look at the requirements for the alternatives analysis. Um, it's, I think I'm just encouraging people to look holistically at this because DTSC has not made any determination of an outcome here, other than we're moving forward on, on proposing to list this product chemical combination and put it through the AA process. There are many, many potential outcomes uh, from that process. Um, so with that in mind and looking at the criteria that um, we are required to meet, please, when you uh, look at the, the comments um, that you might submit, do them in the context of the regulation um, and the process overall. Um, also, um, just to give you some sense of where we go from here, once the comment period closes, then our staff and our team will look at all the comments submitted and evaluate those um, on their merits. And we may, at that point, choose to change something in our proposal. And it depends on the comments we get, our evaluation, um, and we'll go from there. So once that happens, the, um, the next logical step is that then we um, go ahead and move forward in the rulemaking process and at that point, we'll put out the, a technical dom, doc, a final technical, technical document and the other documents required in rulemaking, including our statement of reasons, our fiscal and economic impact statement, and those things. And so that process in and of itself is another formal process um, so that you'll have another chance to participate at that point, too. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you to Simona and the team of uh, scientists and engineers that worked on, very hard on this document. Um, and um, uh, we really appreciate their hard work. Uh, thank you for the support staff uh, here today. And thank you, everyone. And we'll look forward to uh, reading your comments. And with that, we'll conclude this workshop. Thanks.